All right, part two, chapter four. Just really one um, major topic here, and that's homeostasis. And what is homeostasis? This is a very important idea, a very important concept that really is going to be the take-home message for this class. Um, homeostasis is the ability to maintain a relatively constant internal environment within your body. Um, stasis is going to be staying the same, a lack of movement, homeo, human. So um, inside your body, you actually have a very narrow range of what is considered normal. Now the nervous system and the endocrine system are very key players maintaining homeostasis. And um, it's a little easier to think about the endocrine system playing a role in that because the endocrine system is what produces hormones. Uh, hormones, a lot of times we think about hormones just in terms of sexual activity, but there are huge amounts of hormones that are playing a role in your body's activities every day beyond um, anything related to male or female material. Now within homeostasis, the changes that our bodies go through from moment to moment or from hour to hour um, are very minor. And so you have what's written here as normal tolerance limits, right? Where is your body at normally? And you can't go very far besides or beyond that normal range before you have illness and even death. So here you have all of your systems that are important in maintaining homeostasis. And another concept within human biology is that one system and one system alone is not like the system. You just can't take one system and say this is the most important system uh, within the body, even though I might try to ask you that on a discussion forum. Uh, you have the nervous system that regulates and coordinates all the different activities of the other systems. All right, we think about the nervous system in terms of our nerves and um, being able to feel a hot uh, surface and pulling our hand away, but actually the nervous system causes our heart to beat and it causes the GI tract to move material through uh, the intestinal tract. All right, the cardiovascular system transports oxygen and nutrients to tissues. If those tissues didn't have those materials, if the waste wasn't brought away from those, any area within the body, you would, you would move beyond that normal range of homeostasis and become very ill very quickly. All right, the digestive system supplies blood and nutrients and water for the tissues. It rids the body of non-digestible um, material with your GI tract if you get constipated and you aren't you aren't moving the waste out of your body then it just sits there in the intestinal tract and that's garbage and eventually your intestinal tract will just naturally start to do what it's supposed to do in terms of absorbing nutrients except in this case it's absorbing toxins and garbage and you can start feeling very cruddy that can have an effect on your brain activity. You've got um, what's a pretty common term of brain fog. All right, maybe it's your GI tract that's not working properly. Muscular system produces heat, right? Maintains body temperature, maintains movement, the endocrine system. You have all of the different endocrine glands that se secrete hormones regulate and coordinate different activities, regulates metabolism. Um, that system is going to work slower than the nervous system. The nervous system is relatively instant and very constant. And you have the other systems as well. Um, in terms of one system not being any more important than the other, all right, that's true because you can't take one system away and have a properly working human. You can have your favorite system. I particularly 
like the endocrine system and the lymphatic system, or the not necessarily the lymphatic lymphatic system, but the immune system. Um, those are just my favorite. They're more interesting. But other people like the nervous system, the digestive system. Um, so it's all, all of the systems are intermingled, and they are all critical to work together to maintain your internal environment. All right, so what are the mechanisms for maintaining homeostasis? Two major concepts of negative feedback and positive feedback. All right, your, your body is going through its normal activities, and if we're talking about the endocrine system, it pumps hormones out, and it receives feedback. All right, did your body like that? Did it need it? Does the endocrine system need to make more? Does it need to make less? And so with negative feedback, that concept is the output of the system or the output of, say, the endocrine system, those hormones, resolves or corrects the original stimulus. So it stops the gland from making more hormones. That's negative feedback. Positive feedback brings about an increasing change in the same direction. So you keep fueling that hormone being made. All right, your body says, oh, yes, we need it. We need more, so keep making it. And it has a positive feedback. I was trying to think of some normal um, examples to think about negative feedback, positive feedback. I couldn't think of anything, you know, physical, trying to think of cars or traffic. Um, but we hear that... Um, term used positive feedback or negative feedback when we're talking about uh, behavioral changes, encouraging kids to do better. If you give the kid positive feedback, they're going to want to do that behavior again. If it's negative feedback, all right, you can scar the kid for life and they never do it. All right, so with negative feedback, the primary mechanism uh, for maintaining homeostasis is through this. So here, um, in this diagram, you have homeostasis, or a line over this uh, balance here. If you have too much, all right, that's a stimulus. You have the sensor, sends data to the control center, and you have a direct response to the stimulus, and so you have the effect. With the negative feedback, it returns to normal. So with this too much or too little, that feedback goes here, and you maintain homeostasis. All right, but you have to remember there are two components. All right, you have the sensor, you have the control center. And so that sensor is going to be what is going to um, feel that there's a need to change. And then it goes to the control center. That control center can be the brain a lot of times, but it can be the different um, endocrine glands. And then there's that automatic or specific response to the stimulus back here, and you end up with the effect. So the effect within the endocrine system could be the actual molecules being secreted from the thyroid, from the um, adrenal glands. All right. um, positive feedback, you'd keep going. All right. You wouldn't stop. So um, with positive feedback, an example is the secretion of oxytocin uh, during birth to continually increase uterine contraction. And then after the infant is born, there's no more need for, um, or not an excessive need for uterine contractions. You'll still have some contractions, um, but they're going to decrease in intensity, and that is because the oxytocin stops being secreted and you're just um, the continual uterine contractions after birth are going to be as a side effect of that oxytocin that's already in the system. As that oxytocin moves out of the system the uterine contractions stop and so that's actually a pretty good mechanism in terms of of our body knowing what it needs. Those uterine contractions after birth are good to help the uterus and to stop potential bleeding. 
but it doesn't have to occur for very long. Another example is fever. All right, our, temperature, our body temperature rises as a direct influence of different chemical signals. And if those chemical signals continue to be given, then um, the fever will continue to rise. All right, and that positive feedback, those chemical signals cause the fever or cause the hypothalamus to change the body temperature. And that can actually be harmful if the fever goes too high. A low fever when you're fighting a cold is actually beneficial or um, fighting an infection. Uh, but when the system gets in this rut of this positive feedback and the fever continues to rise, it can be very dangerous. All right, so just as a review, um, which of the following organs are not in the urinary system? And uh, you looked at a lot of different organ systems in this chapter, but it's going to be on the uh, big level, right? Big picture. And so this may be, or this is an example of what you might see for an exam question. So kidney, liver, bladder, urethra, ureter, which one of these is not part of the urinary system? Key, the Jeopardy music, and the answer is the liver. All right, the liver is going to be an accessory organ for the digestive system and not part of the urinary system. And hopefully you'll be able to get uh, this type of information by just spending some time looking at those major pictures and just the short um, tidbits of information underneath um, the figure. Let me go back real fast. These figures here. All right. Um, urinary system. All right. Organs are the kidneys, the urinary bladder. And then you have the ureters here, you have the bladder, you have the urethra. And so if you want to make flashcards uh, for these systems, that would be great. You've got the integumentary system. What are its functions? Protect the body, provide, or provides temperature control, uh, temperature homeostasis. Synthesizes vitamin D, receives sensory input. The organ is the skin. Right, cardiovascular system, the organ is the heart. So that would be just um, a quick study tip. All right, and then just summary. Um, big picture here, the four types of tissues, epithelial, muscular, nervous, connective, and the different organ systems, integumentary, cardiovascular, lymphatic, digestive, nervous, reproductive, endocrine, urinary, respiratory, muscular, skeletal, and big concept of homeostasis and the necessary types of feedback that are involved in maintaining homeostasis. So this is the end of chapter, or of unit, yes, chapter four, but of unit one, where uh, unit or exam one will cover.